The Talk Station presents Faith Matters, a look at contemporary stories and issues from a faith perspective. While this is a pre recorded show, we are interested in your ideas, comments, and questions, and we urge you to email them to faithmatters at the talk station faith matters and welcome to faith matters here on the talk station fm 107 and am 1240 and uh, thanks for joining us here today and uh as we get started uh just uh, introduce our panel once again reverend robert cornegy from chapel by the sea in emerald isle also reverend mark woods is with us uh, from uh from cherry point united methodist church and uh, and also uh, bishop doc loomis from all saints anglican church and uh, and people are sitting in different places, so I'm, I'm going to get confused different chairs, right? with different chairs. I got I got a great chair. I'm, I know I'm going to get confused here at some point in time. Uh, not that I'm not already. Um, let's start today with a uh, governor's uh, um, veto of a bill, or the and the ramifications of passing this bill, and it's not North Carolina. <laughs> Um, but talking about uh, Georgia, in Georgia, the the headline from the Christian Science Monitor is why Georgia governor defied his base over religious liberty. When the Governor Nathan Deal vetoed a bill Monday that would have allowed Georgians with sincere religious beliefs to deny services to gay people, he suggested he was doing it in the, quote, loving, kind, and generous spirit of the people of his state. But Governor Deal, who does not have to face re-election, also did something else through his veto. He essentially stepped in a political heat shield uh, by standing up to his religious base, a deal put, has put himself in a situation where the conservative legislators who passed the bill, uh, quote, can cuss him, says Charles Bullock, a political scientist at the University of Georgia. Indeed, at a time of mounting populism in national politics, it is a decision that rankles. The quote from uh, conservative commentator Eric Erickson of Macon, Georgia, who is occasionally heard on this uh, station filling in for people, says uh, what conservatives in Georgia are now seeing is that big business, big businesses have the ear of Governor Deal in a way very small businesses and churches do not. Well, as Governor Deal, is this a big deal, Robert? Well, you know, he if it quacks like a lame duck, <laughs> walks like a lame duck yeah it is a lame duck he's he can't run again and so he's he's free he doesn't have to worry about his his political future there so um yeah he's he's um he's took a a, a tactical step towards um the business community mm-hmm. and uh, we'll see where this goes he's sort of he sort of moved away from the the um, heart of the the belt down there, the Bible Belt. You know, they say Atlanta is kind of the buckle of the Bible Belt. So mm-hmm. uh, he's uh, he's he's going. There's going to be some pushback. It'll be interesting to see what happens. This was a a year ago. Indiana Governor, and this again from this article, Indiana Governor Mike Pence signed a state religious freedom restoration act uh, that faced a nationwide backlash that for, forced the law to be revised. And there's a national freedom. Uh, we discussed that when this happened with uh, mm-hmm. Mike Pence. We had this on this show. So, um, uh, according to uh, Carl Gilson, uh, the political scientist at Southern Methodist University, says Deal's veto is important. I think Pence's experience in Indiana, which is one where he gave the social conservatives what they wanted and got crushed, is very instructive for Governor Deal. Uh, Doc, you you feel the same way? I mean, is this is this something that uh, bothers you uh, from from one side or another? No, no, and that's the answer. That's, <laughs> that's as far as you're going. This today. is this <laughs> is I, come on. This is about a guy who's responsible for a state, and the state has a budget, and that budget derives income from places, and one of the big places that's a burgeoning industry in Georgia is is the movie industry. Mm-hmm. And uh, he knew that taking a stand that was conservative was going to, he was told by the movie industry, greats, including people like Disney, that they simply wouldn't come to the state anymore. Mm-hmm. And it's so, in, in many ways, it's, you know, it's bowing to the financial, uh, his financial responsibility. 
And I guess somebody might say, if you were an agnostic, that you can hardly blame a guy for that. He was doing something that made sense. He did watch what happened in Indiana. You remember, uh, what was the gal's name, Angie whatever from Angie's List was going to take her world headquarters out of Indianapolis and all that. And I know he's... You know, he's thinking about these things. But here's the deal. I, I get so exhausted reading articles about this stuff that, that, that says Governor Deal is a prophet. He could see which way America was going, and he's simply stepping out in front, you hmm. know, and, 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 and opening, opening the state for everybody regardless of a- anything. The, the whole issue of political expediency for us as Christians is so bizarre because we follow a, a man who was in no way politically expedient. Jesus could have made a lot of decisions that would have been politically expedient, Mm -hmm. not the least of which would have been raising up an army and kicking the Romans' backsides out of of the Holy Land. But he didn't. He did what was right. And as Christian people, we're always confronted with the issue. Are we going to do what's expedient or are we going to do what's right? Politicians? Mm -hmm. Expedient. Yeah, the quote, uh, instead of being a prophet, is more like the old quote from the movie of follow the money. Uh, It's where the money is going to going to go is going to drive that mark what what's your feeling here Yeah, it's economics it's economics all the way down and to get ourselves that politics is anything but economics Mm -hmm. that's just that's just ridiculous i mean it's 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 economics all the way down what happens often in a case like this and it's i think we look at the same case with the uh, transgender uh, charlotte ordinance and the and pushback from the state legislature in north carolina is that then it goes away from what what was being billed as a moral argument into an argument about as you said business and economics money politics uh, both sides raising funds off of these issues and both sides um, you know basically trying to um, extort the other uh, to 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 gain their end, you know. So isn't is that politics as usual, Robert? And where do Christians yeah, stand? Yeah, it is. Here? You know, from a faith perspective, you know, it's it's really troubling. There are two. You know, the, we used to call it the third rail mm-hmm. politics uh, that you didn't touch, and um, and it's because we have two two now, two mm-hmm. third rails or a third and a fourth. Mm-hmm. Whatever we have, yeah. To, we have um, abortion, mm-hmm. and we have um, um, issues around sexual orientation, mm-hmm. and those are the rails that if you don't, you, you know, you're quickly labeled on the wrong side of history if you um, if you d- disagree mm-hmm. with the popular culture perspective on that that populism that the author of that article um, brought up, and so we're seeing a, the the government doing what government's going to do. The government's going to protect its interest. The problem is, um, you know, there's a pretty good population of people in in Georgia that feel like they just lost mm-hmm. um, some rights. And the, the, as I understand it, yeah, you know, they're not even talking about the issue. Well, quite some, frankly, some protections. At yeah, that was a it was a protection. It was a it was sort of a, a local government effort to head off a federal. Um, some federal issues that we're mm-hmm. seeing in the court right now with the, you know, we'll, I think we, we may the North talk Carolina about law that's coming the North up. Carolina law and plus with the, the religious freedom issues that are brought up by the sisters of the poor. So um, little sisters of the poor. So yeah, it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's which, which uh, political group has more clout than the other, sadly. And, um, the financial one is um, obviously the one he chose. So we'll see what happens. There's supposedly a move in, in the legislature to try to, you know, overturn his veto. So we'll we'll see where that goes. And, and again, let's relate this to as the media is doing to North Carolina and, and Governor McCrory's refusal to veto the bill from the legislature that overturned the Charlotte ordinance. Now. There's a lot of I frankly I think it's a, a bad law bad law in Charlotte resulted in bad law at the legislature in my mm-hmm. my opinion mm-hmm. um, when it could have been handled with injunctions it could have been gone straight to the court anyway so uh, but it has become a battle now that has is framed up much the same way now is that the the actual 
arguments for or against it are being outweighed by whether or not business is going to be affected. Is right. the All Star Game going to get pulled from Charlotte now? Is uh, are there going to be ramifications for lots of other things? And and um, to me, it's, it shows that business. You know, the the Supreme Court ruling that business uh, businesses are are people. Mm-hmm. Um, well, yes, uh, well, they, they're both stupid and hypocritical. It, it's <laughs> interesting how there there are battle lines lining up as there are in all issues. Mm-hmm. But what's really interesting to see is you know, so now now the state of New York doesn't want anybody to come to North Carolina because of our situation. They're right. putting a travel ban. They're calling it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. on North Carolina. Disney's not going to go to Georgia, you know, unless this thing works. What you're seeing is you're, you're going to start seeing corporations pit themselves against one another, not based on their product or their customer service, but based on their position mm-hmm. on issues of human sexuality, abortion, etc. You're actually going to see legislatures pit. The, this is like the Civil War all over again. Whole states, seriously? New York is banning mm-hmm. people from going to North Carolina? That's their travel ban? This is, it's, um, this, the, back, the back end of this thing is really freaky to me mm-hmm. because we're going to have municipalities fighting with other municipalities, states against states, corporations against corporations. What a fun world we live in. <laughs> Gosh. You, you find it as uh, being certainly an interesting time to, to live in here. But uh, do you see, uh, is there a correlation with what's going on in North Carolina with this Georgia bill? Do you see it? You know, in terms of the actual issues? No. In terms of the media and, mm-hmm. the, and the corporate reaction and all of that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're 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 packaging it the same way, and the parties yeah. involved. Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, there's a very clear LGBT movement, exactly, that is is mm-hmm. is at odds with a conservative majority, and its representative uh, government. Yeah, sure. But the issues are very different issues. Yeah, very very distinct issues. More to come in a moment here on Faith Matters on the Talk Station FM 107 and AM 1240. Faith Matters here on the Talk Station FM 107 and AM 1240. I'm Ben Ball along with uh, uh, Bishop Doc Loomis and Reverend Mark Woods and Reverend Robert Carnegie. Uh, and we want to talk today about a uh, really a follow-up story. Uh, it is a follow-up in, because it's before the Supreme Court now, which is a, a evenly divided uh, Supreme Court, as, as supposedly four to four uh, for conservatives and liberals. And with the uh, death of uh, Justice um, um, uh, now I'm going to forget his name. Justice Scalia. 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 There you go. Uh, and the uh, Little Sisters of the Poor case, though, coming before the Supreme Court for oral arguments. And in an order this past Tuesday afternoon, this is from the Daily Signal, which comes from the Heritage Foundation, says in an order Tuesday afternoon, the Supreme Court asked the petitioners in the Obama administration to file supplemental briefs in the consolidated challenge to Obamacare's requirement that nonprofit employers provide employee health insurance coverage that includes potentially life-ending drugs and devices. Many employers, such as Little Sisters of the Poor, Priests for Life, and Religious Colleges and Charities, object to including Plan B, uh, Ella, con- um, what is that? Ella contraception and sterilization in their health insurance plans. Under the current regulations, employers must either submit a self-certification form to their insurer or health plan administrator to notify the Department of Health and Human Services of their religious objection to providing such coverage in writing and provide contact information for the health plan insurer or third-party administrator. Either way, the actions taken by the employer will authorize the inclusion of coverage of the objectionable drugs and devices in its health plan. Little Sisters of the Poor have long objected to this. They were they brought this uh, case uh, similar to the Hobby Lobby case at the time, and uh, and it has been now just coming before the court, a court that will, you know, in many instances probably divide uh, four to four on a lot of cases. But here the justices seem to be giving an uh, an open argument because they want to know more. They want to ask for some supplemental um, findings and filings here too. The the a, the oral argument is being explained by one of the colleagues of uh, the person that's writing this article for the Daily Signal, says that um, 
The Little Sisters made it clear today that they object to the government taking over the health care plan and forcing them to facilitate abortion and contraceptive coverage or pay millions of dollars in penalties, according to their lawyer. Um, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, where this goes now. This seems to be um, that they would have an obvious, clear religious objection. Robert, what do you, what's what's the holdup here? Well, the government hasn't really presented an, an alternative to their alternative. Mm-hmm. You know, they came up with this this way to avoid it, which was not really a way to to avoid what they were trying to avoid. These religious-based organizations are saying that we don't want to offer these abortifacients and the birth control and the other parts that the – this is not a part of the um, Affordable Care Act. This is a part of – this is a HS, mm-hmm. a health, a human health service, whatever it is. A rule about what needs to be included in health It's a ruling. It's plans. a regulation. Yeah. And uh, so they are they are appealing and saying no. Actually, they they won in the lower court. Mm-hmm. It was the it was the government that brought it up to the Supreme Court. And um, so they're they're saying, look, you know, whether we do it um, your way or or either way, we are basically saying, give you know, include these things in our health plan, and we don't want them in the health plan. Right. And so the government has not really come up with a way to avoid doing that. And uh, so, from, from what I understand from reading the article and some other articles that I read, is that they are, um, there, there's a sense that the justices are, are sensitive to this issue mm-hmm. of uh, um, the government overstepping its, its boundaries when it comes to interpreting Scripture directly, mm-hmm. <laughs> which is basically what they're doing. So, uh, and so they're asking for the, at least on the government side and, and the others, to come up with a plan where that wouldn't happen at all. Where they, if, if you say you don't want to do it, you right. don't have to do it. You're exempt from it. And yep. the, the remarkable thing about this is that when you look at the companies that are already exempt, I mean, there are a lot of organizations that are exempted from this already, mm-hmm. and they're not religious-based organizations. It's it's just wacky the way this thing is working out. So, um, you know, I'm thinking we got, there's a pretty good chance that, that the Supreme Court's going to come up with a mm-hmm. – you know, like they do now. Right. They legislate. They come up with a way around. So a, they're going to legislate a workaround yeah. on this thing. What do you, mm-hmm. Which is not their job, frankly. Mark, what do you th- think here? Yeah, it's just such a different way to imagine the world. Um, I, I think the little sisters are imagining. Um, they're they're just they're imagining providing health for women and children in such a different way than we imagine health, right? Than we when we legislate health or something like that. Uh, th- there is something about nurturing and caring and everything. That that sort of loses its way in our healthcare system, right? It just it loses its way, and for the for the meaning, it doesn't have to attain for theology, right? It doesn't have to contain any theology. Providing healthcare doesn't have, isn't a right. theological. It's thing. a list, right? But for for Christians, and yes. I would I would imagine especially for the little sisters, it is a theological thing to nurture care. Be in relationship with women who are who are struggling through pregnancies and this kind of thing. So it's just a different way to imagine the world. So I mean, the fact that you have like kind of two sides on this thing talking to each other, it would seem like they would have to really speak very different language. So I could imagine a a Supreme Court, you know, four on four there, just finding it very difficult. To, to to imagine the world from the perspective of the little sisters and from the perspective of you know government health care from the, from the legal side uh, the the author of this article Elizabeth Slattery uh, is a writing saying that uh, hopefully the court will follow its long-standing precedent she quotes the precedent which prohibits courts from being arbiters of scriptural interpretation uh, doc is I think that's an be an interesting uh, um, milestone I think in legal history to say that the courts will not uh, be scriptural, uh, interpret scripture for us. Yes, we're we're at, in this country. We're protected. It's a part of our religious liberties to express our faith as we understand it, and not as our government understands it. That should be clear. You know, when we last left the Little Sisters, they were this case was coming up to the Supreme Court. It was a court without 
Justice Scalia, which meant it was an even-numbered court, and having already won uh, at the appellate level in the at uh, in Texas, I think it was, um, a split decision here would remand that back to that decision. As I think we've right. talked about that in the yeah. past. What what's the highlight of this article really is what the two just what the justices have requested here. I don't know if we really went into that, but they've. There is a, speaking to what Mark said, I think that the, actually the Supreme Court justices have used the word, uh, the government has hijacked their health care, which I think is a recognition that the government is, is forcing them to do something very different and, than what they think is health care. I know it's not a deep and theological position that the government has here, but at least they recognize that their, that their health care is being hijacked. It's being, it's being turned into something other than the way they understand it. This request that's being made or this mandate that's being made by the justices to go out and find a way to make this work is a really good sign. I mean, I did not really think they had a shot in front of the Supreme Court. But this is, and of course that's the, mm-hmm. the text of the article, is saying this is a really good day for the little sisters of the poor. Mm-hmm. And I, hope, I do hope that's true. But uh, but why should that not extend beyond religious organizations to anyone who also holds those beliefs? I mean, I think that's a, that's the argument is that the nose under the tent will be if they win, then what is to keep other organizations from also uh, having that excluded from their health? Well, and that's why you have courts, and that's why you have judges and mm-hmm. attorneys and everything out because you, of course. Yeah, there are already organizations that are exempt from this. Mm-hmm. They've gotten wa- waivers from this ruling. There are Fortune 500 companies exactly. that have absolutely zero religious context at all that are exempt from this. Yeah, so what, what we're going to see as this progresses, if they do uphold this hijacking and mm-hmm. say, we've got we've to step that back, you've got to provide a way for these um, uh, people of religious conscience Mm -hmm. to be able to not participate in this without um, violating their consciences, which the method that they've set up now, the little sisters are saying violates their consciences. And so, so if that happens, then uh, we've made a pretty good step. That's that I would say that's a victory for the religion, the conscientious objectors well, let's, of uh, these things. Let me go back to the Georgia bill for a second. If that okay. happens, though, does that also extend to other ideas of a religious exception? And the, the, the other side of the argument is, you know, we're going to use it for, and this is what they're suggesting in the Georgia article, mm-hmm. we'll use it for discrimination. We'll use it for, you know, we don't want to serve these people, so we'll do that. And we'd love to say that, oh, Christians would never do that. We're so loving. and No, we do that all the time. That, that's what we're, we're mm-hmm. implicit in that kind of thing. And so that's, that's the other side of this. I think you're going to – they're just going to butt heads, and I think that's part of the reason that the Supreme Court is finding this so difficult mm-hmm. is we don't want to set it up. And I, I, I would agree with the other side. Like, I, I don't want to set it up so that I can discriminate in my church against people. I don't want that to be – I don't want to have the option to do that because chances are in my own sin I will end up doing that not realizing it, right? But then on the other hand, as what we're talking about, we don't want that kind of hijack. We don't want that kind of, well, you have to do something that will make you you know, complicit with sin or something like that. It, but it, and, and then again, the other arguments we've talked about before, does that put the government in a position of being the moral arbiter? Exactly. Yeah. That's, that's, where, that's where we are now. And like, that's the... That's the problem that we're confronting, that we had originally designed a limited government role for the federal system, and now it's basically uh, creeping, you know, creeping uh, um, into these areas, and we'll see where it goes. More to come in a moment here on Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240.
Welcome back to Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And I'm Ben Ball, and along with uh, Reverend Mark Woods, Reverend Robert Cornegie, and Bishop Doc Loomis. And uh, t- in this segment, we're going to talk about an article that comes out of uh, actually the Las Vegas Review Journal originally, and then it was re- reprinted in some other papers there too. But it says, a uh, the headline is, Muslim Congressional Candidate Says Reed Dissuaded Him From Running Because of His Religion. A Democrat running for the open 3rd Congressional District seat says that U.S. Senator Harry Reid dissuaded him from running, saying because he's Muslim and cannot win the race. Uh, Jesse Sabaya, uh, a Henderson attorney who immigrated from Jordan with his family at age 11, sent out a fundraising email blast to supporters Tuesday headline, Don't Let Harry Reid and the Washington Elites Decide Who can uh, who You Can Vote For. Although Sabaya... Um, uh, I think I'm saying that right, Sabea. Uh, the first time congressional candidate stands by his account. The Senate minority leader's aide strongly denies it. He, both sides agree a meeting took place, but they disagree what Reed, Democrat from Nevada, and his associates told Sabea. Uh, so the Washington Post first reported on the meeting, which unfolded in, in a Paris, uh, Las Vegas conference room on August 25th. So, so he is saying that Harry Reid, who is a um, who is a Democrat, uh, and here this guy is running for this open seat because Representative Joe Heck, the Republican in Nevada, is running for the Senate seat. He's saying him he trying to dissuade him because of his religion. Is it because of his religion? Is it ex- political expediency, or even did it happen? Now, who are we to believe, and what are we to believe here? So, Robert, it's really hard to from the article because it gives you both. It's hard to plumb this from the article. You get both sides on this, and well, and might, you can believe both sides really. That might be a good article then, if you yeah, get both sides. exactly. <laughs> but it is pretty pretty even handed. Um, the um, in fact, he the Sabia says um, he says let he says that the quote he says I think the quote was let me be blunt, you're not going to win the race because you're a Muslim. That was uh, Sabia mm-hmm. recalling what Reed had said to him, the quote, let that me di- be blunt. But is that dissuading him from running, or is it just saying, here's what I believe are the political realities of, uh, of life here in Nevada? What do you think, Doc? Uh, yeah. Uh, the interesting thing is, you know, this is this guy is making the deal out of this. This mm-hmm. is something that happened back in what, like August mm-hmm. of last year. Well, he, he's doing it as a fundraiser. So. Yes, and so the deal is that um, the deal is that that Harry Reid didn't bring this up. Harry Reid. I mean, I, that, that I can tell. There's nobody out there publicizing this guy's a Muslim. Don't vote for him. This was a private conversation, and even if Harry Reid did say it to him, my gosh, that's kind of what we do. I mean, I remember when my daughter got ready to get married to the jerk she's married to right now. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> when she got ready to get married, I can remember sitting down with her and having a very simple conversation like that, too. Let me be blunt. I mean, these, these are the kinds of things we do. And in politics, it happens all the time because of the, politi- the expediency of seeing to it that, you're, you know, that your party wins and that mm-hmm. the, the, the networks keep, keep going. Gosh, I, whether it happened or not, welcome to politics. This is what this is what happens. But then you know, there's this huge kind of uh, wave uh, coming through our country right now of political correctness and and uh, gender equality and religious diversity and all this. And that wave lifts up every con- every everything like this that happens. You know, this guy picks up a surfboard and says, "I think I'll get on that wave," and that's. What it is? It's just a it's a story of a surfer guy. But, but uh, Senator Reid may have. I mean, the conversation may have been very blunt like that, or it also could have been you're going to have a hard time winning mm-hmm. because you're a Muslim. I mean, that sounds like spelling out what the uh, what the uh, political reality of the landscape may be like instead of saying it to uh, you're just not going to win. Um, well, I love the next sentence. Mm-hmm. Reid's spokeswoman, Kristen Orthman, said Tuesday, Senator Reid didn't say that. <laughs> so there you go. Right. Again, the denial. Yeah. <laughs> but uh Mark, it sounds a lot like politics as usual though. Yeah, no, I, I think I think I, I think Doc's comments are mm-hmm. I think they're right on. This prob that's probably the way it went down. I, I, I we don't know, but I think that it was probably, you know, if you're going to run as a Muslim, right now Muslims in our country, a lot in, in a lot of places, you know, they're they're we're we're not very friendly all the time, right? Um, and I think the 
presidential debates is a is a perfect example of when we we're we're just not friendly on something. But I think I think I think this would be a good thing. So, I, I mean, uh, the, actually, I do wonder if, if um, um, you know how what kind of backlash anybody would have. I mean, uh, we we have seen religious backlashes to candidacies as as recently as Mitt Romney running mm-hmm. you know, for mm-hmm. president. Well, so. we're definitely getting getting it on the other on the Christian side. So, um, but you know, it's fascinating. This guy's gotten all kinds of advice. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, this was a, this is a Republican seat, mm-hmm. so it has been. So, um, um, you know, for a Democrat to come in, he was actually advised at one point to run as a moderate Republican mm-hmm. against the person whom Harry Reid is actually backing, right. the woman that he, the Democrat, that he has actually kind of thrown his support behind. So, you know, I think it was one of those moments when, you know, you've got to look at where the power alignment is and maybe Reed, let's give him the benefit of the doubt, was trying to say, you know, go back, get some more. Your This is your first first run. Mm-hmm. So uh, don't don't go for the big, do some local stuff first. That, that's kind of the way that that, that discussion went. Did, did you see the little nugget in this, though? Because in an effort at defamation of this poor guy, Harry Reid's camp released this text that he allegedly sent, and the text was the one that said, I'm still trying to figure out which district will give me the best opportunity to serve our country. Do you, see, this is funny to me, because do you remember when, when, we, when people used to run for political office to serve their constituency, like the people right. they went to high school with and the people that owned the local shops in their community and all that, and it was a real big deal to be considered mm-hmm. a representative and a representative democracy of people you actually knew and lived with, and now it has become... It's been Hillary. It's Hillary Clinton in New York. Right. Are you That's kidding me? I was going to say. I'm going to. I'm going to go and then to couch that in this kind of language, wherever I can best serve my country. Are you kidding? It's wherever you yeah. can get elected and get a job. And it's just. It's. It's. Yeah. I, yeah. I can't imagine well, voting for this well, guy if I lived in a community where he didn't. It's interesting in Carteret County right now. There's a debate about a guy who won election to the school board about whether or not he actually lives in the district or will ever live in the in the district that he represents, even though he's voted on countywide. But uh, for congressional races, there's nothing in the Constitution that uh, that requires them to actually live in their district, and we've we've had that many times. Our our local congressman has for a while, depending on how the gerrymandering was working at the particular it time, did not live. Here. Didn't it? Yeah. yeah, did not mm-hmm. live in the district, so uh, it, it it that changes quite often. Uh, but it, when I was on fire department, we were required to live in the community that we served. Mm-hmm. That was a, that is oftentimes a requirement in municipalities for police officers, uh, for elected officials, etc. It, it is bizarro that we've come to a place where where I can now move to another state and run for elected office there because I have a better chance of being elected. Because Bubba, that's about me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, and this and that is not the way this government was set up. It was not set up to be about me. But back on the idea of again whether or not a Muslim is going to face that kind of uh, that kind of grief, I think they are, no matter where they run and where they what they do. But we, I would, I would think it'd be abhorrent as an American to try to ever dissuade somebody based on that reason. That reason for well, that's what running. he's claiming happened. Now, yeah. whether it happened or not, it's debated. But uh, his his fundraising appeal was based on that that deal coming from Reed that Reed mm-hmm. said you're not going to do it because you're you, you can't win because you're a Muslim, and that's uh, yeah, I agree with you that's that's. But it's interesting where that comes from. I think we we get surprised by that. He probably was very surprised, and whether or not those words were exactly that, he was probably very surprised that Harry Reid would even bring that up. But that's the wave I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. I mean, there is no he. There's nothing in here about his political positions or how he feels about mm-hmm. anything. Right. It is this. There is a. There's a sympathy right now to people who are, seem to be on the outside of society, and people are making fun of them, and people are calling them names and you know racial slurs against them, and that's enough to sway people's votes. Mm-hmm. Oh, that poor guy. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it's also poor, yeah. It's also the anti-establishment. Mm-hmm. wave that's going yes. on the populist wave that you know well, the, and, if you're in what, the the yeah. elite inside the bubble then uh, you need to get somebody that's not in the bubble well that's what his fundraising effort seems to certainly be centered around mm-hmm. is that uh, and and there's a, there's a, some uh, kind of a oh, I think a delicious irony there is that <laughs> that he is he is running against the Washington elite uh in in saying that in, mm-hmm. in saying that we can when um uh, when when he also has the conversation about where where he should run to be part of that, to be part of that as well. 
but that's politics, and we've discussed politics a lot here today. But that's the uh, that's kind of the nature of the beast is uh, is how you have to line up and see where your where your best allegiances are going to be. But I go back to the idea of the of the religious and and the political correctness of it. I think we are surprised sometimes when people uh, expound uh, um, ideas that we might be again surprised that they would express. And I only draw on this from personal example. Back in college in the seventies, I, I went out with an African American uh, girl a couple times, and and I had a former girlfriend who actually now is probably the most liberal person I know, uh, who say to me, you know, people are going to talk. Uh. I mean, I was shocked. I was shocked that she would take that position. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that you know, people are going to talk about that. Uh. You keep on doing that. So, um, and to me, that was that was laughable. Because it wasn't the furthest thing from my mind, but this is a again an example. Where do you where do you see then? Uh, obviously, you know, the this, the article isn't spelling this out, but as you said, Robert, it's a Republican district. It's been long held as a Republican seat, and it's going to be very difficult for anybody to make a wave. But then, but often people do run so they can become better known and then run again for something else. Yeah. So, so we may not. We may not have seen the last of him here, right? Yeah, he may be setting the stage for something else, you know, maybe more local, perhaps, or, or when another seat mm-hmm. opens up. Reed's retiring. Yeah, that's right. So there's going to be an opening there. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, we'll see what happens there in Nevada, but an uh, interesting story again to make the national press. This is uh, Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 at AM 1240, and we'll have more to come in a moment. Welcome back here on Faith Matters on the Talk Station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And I'm Ben Ball, along with Bishop Doc Loomis, Reverend Robert Carnegie, and uh, Reverend Mark Woods. And talking about in our final segment here today, this is a uh, bill. In fact, I, I need to go look it up and see if it changed any today. But the Tennessee Senate ha- Committee has approved the Bible bill. This is from the Tennessean. A bill that would make the Holy Bible the official book of Tennessee was given approval in a legislative committee on Tuesday with a 7-1 to vote. The Senate Judiciary Committee advanced the legislation sponsored by uh, Senator Steve Sutherland from Morristown, who's a Republican, who says while the measure received approval in the House with a 55-38 vote last year, the effort was curtailed in the Senate, which opted to send it to committee. And I understand that uh, it is going, I guess, going back before um, the Senate now that the committee has approved it. So uh, they, the Bible, the Holy Bible, as the official book of Tennessee. This seems to strike right at the church-state issue. What do you think, Mark? Yeah. I, have, I have a couple questions here. Uh-huh, right. do, all st- <laughs> do all states have state, state books? books? That's a thing? Yeah, I don't know. They, states have lots of state things. I learned today that state flower of, uh, of uh, South Carolina, by the way, is the Carolina jessamine, which is poisonous. <laughs> but it's their <laughs> state flower. So. That makes sense. Um, but what, now, if it is a state book, what does it do? Uh, this is my second question. It, it Why just, is that aff- important? It just affords it the honor of being the state book. The honor. That's all. Okay. All right. All right. The, the, those are my two questions. <laughs> and that's well, it. Can do. anybody petition to make a book the state book? You, is, you, that, is that uh, possible? As a you citizen can, of that state? I have, I have several books. You can, like have, uh, you can have uh, – you can, if you can get a local legislator to do that, you can have a bill that, that looks for any object to be the state object of whatever that is. Wow, lizard. That is yeah, rock. there's state lizards and rocks. Tree, and, bird. Yeah. It's sort of like the, the fascination we have right now with uh, what day is it today. Do you realize that today is National Clam on the Half Shell Day? It is National Crayon Day. Yesterday was National Pencil Day, so we graduated from that. It is also, get this one, it is National Bunsen Burner Day. Who knew that Bunsen Burners had a day in this country? Well, it I is mean, today, my friends. Yeah, though that makes sense, Bunsen Burners. I mean, come on. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, when, my, my other question, I, I still, I'm still, we still haven't finished my questions here. Mm-hmm. Which Bible is it? Because I would oh, buy for the, the Latin Vulgate in the 4th century one, not that liberal 16th century one. <laughs> so, Which Bible is it? I mean, what what are, are, are the Deuterocanonical books included in that? 
Is it the short or the long ending of Mark? Mark. That yeah, that's right. Use? I got a feeling Ooh. it's the King James. Only yeah, version. They, they, <laughs> 1611, 16th. Yeah, there's a, well, there's a dozen of those, too. I think it is. Now, that Actually, doesn't sound very American because that is a British Bible. I don't think Yeah, but if it feels good you, enough for Paul, hey, it's You've not read the Bible. Right. <laughs> right. This, is, this is not a, a generic. This is the actual Bible carried by Daniel Boone. It is the <laughs> actual book itself. Did, okay. you, was there, did, I, did I misread that? No, is that right? Is that yeah. right? Because I may have misread it. Because it could be Daniel Boone. And, and I think it's the actual... It might not be. I don't know. I might, I might, have, read, that I might have read that into the article. I, maybe I was hopeful. <laughs> <laughs> that could very well be. I just, I just didn't know if... No, I think it's just the generic Bible. I'm rereading it now, and I see my error. Okay. The um, it, uh, the which article. one is it? I mean, this this is going to be the. Well, it's day, the right? Holy Bible. The whole yeah, the one. The oh, whole one. oh, not the unholy one. Right. right it's the Holy sense. Bible. It's yeah. the one the traveling Bible salesman sells at your home. The great big one with the pictures inside of it. I mean, mm. the Gideons should have an issue with this as well, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, Schofield, man, I'm Schofield, or Ryrie, one good. or the other. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I think you bring up a lot of great points here now. Oh, maybe it's just the apocrypha. No, no, no. Maybe, maybe. Uh, but the uh, the 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 Holy Bible again is, and the headline today is that the Bible Bill is expected to pass Senate. This is out of Tennessee and today. It says, and, and this is uh, recorded on Thursday. It says, despite, despite their opposition, top leaders of the Senate anticipate the bill to make the Bible the official book of Tennessee to receive approval when it comes up on a vote in the chamber's floor. It's fundamentally wrong. I think it's sacrilegious. Senate Majority Leader Mark Norris uh, said on Wednesday, adding he believes that there will be enough votes for the controversial bill to pass. I think people are concerned that their vote will be misconstrued I think that's pretty obvious. Um, but Norris opposed the bill last year and led the effort to send it to a committee, effectively killing the legislation for the year. Uh, all, uh, his quote here is interesting. He says, all I know is I hear Satan snickering. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? He wants to place this on a theological ground, grounding that, that a state should not be doing this. Uh, uh, well, yeah, that's the big debate, and it goes back to the displaying the Ten Commandments. And federally, you know, the Supreme Court ruled that the, a display of the Ten Commandments is a historical display, not a religious display. Mm -hmm. And so the debate is, and 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 it passed. They they voted it in, yeah, and so now they're trying to align their this um, this uh, law doing this to uh, fit that historical rather than yeah. religious I'll, context. I'll, I'll make the same comment I made back then. I said, I'm much more concerned about whether or not the Ten Commandments are on someone's heart That's right. than they are on the wall of, a, of a, any That's right. particular All right, now building. I know Mark's not going to say this on his own, but I'm sitting here, I'm, I'm dying. I have got to know, Mark, what State book? book, North Carolina, what should it be? Obviously the Twilight series. I mean, that goes out without it. <laughs> Outstanding, <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm totally with you on that one. I didn't even think it needed to be said. I'm, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think our audience deserves to know. I, I know. mean... <laughs> Harry Potter fans are going to be really I was disappointed. About to say, Harry I know, Potter I know fans going. might be, might be, might be well, like, disappointed. You, Maybe the, see, the uh, no, no, wait a minute. You, you'd have a different one for a multi-volume set. That would be a different. Oh, okay. So that would be the multi-volume set book. Oh, state, state book object. Yes, I okay, really think we ought to have different. county books because we have a hundred <laughs> counties in North Carolina, county, and every county, county could have a right. book, and then you could do an immense series on that. That could be that's true. Really, that's the great true. books. Series do you think people notice at home right now that we're stretching miserably to get through this segment? <laughs> <laughs> do you think anybody noticed that, that at all? I think all the two people that are listening <laughs> probably switched well, I, over to. I mean, we agree Robbie that this is somewhat ridiculous, somewhere. right? I mean, that's why we're we're throwing this out. I mean. But it's not ridiculous to the Senate in yeah. Tennessee. The, They're taking this on. I, and the yeah, fact that are. we would try to separate history and religion, I mean, for Christianity, that's impossible. Mm -hmm. I mean, part of what makes us Christian is our history. That's It, well, it, it is our identity. Just look for stuff. You know, when, when they passed the bill in the House of North Carolina to make the Scotch bonnet the official shell of North mm -hmm. Carolina. Do you think that that was a that was racist, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you think the Irish felt about that? That's a horrible a yeah. scotch bonnet. It's a nice shell. You got to love on. you have to love a state though who's got scotch as its national anything <laughs> state anything. That's pretty cool. That's well, true. That's true. We have uh, Wikipedia lists this is just killing time. Wikipedia lists 10 items at least for every state. State bird, state flower, state mammal, state 
well, they're not state shells for every state that I'm aware of. State fossil. Did you know we have a state fossil? I did not. That's right. But you're it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we do. It's the ammonite. My picture's there. It's the, it's the ammonite. <laughs> not the ammonites in the Bible. I was about to say, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> That's a different critter. <laughs> Now Man. this is uh, the, the music. The attorney general, <laughs> the attorney general of Tennessee, has said, you know, this is this is just not going to pass muster when you try to apply uh, ideas of uh, of uh, federal and state constitutions uh, to it to, to to designate the Holy Bible as a um, uh, as the official state book, even though it doesn't carry with it. Right. Any particular idea that it must now it must show up in every classroom now it must show up in every uh, home or you know every building must have a copy it doesn't carry with it anything so. wouldn't it, wouldn't it be great if all of us Christian people do gooding do good things in the state were more interested in making the Bible the official book of people's lives of our lives right. 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 and the, not the, of the, our this states is a, this is the point that that's probably the point that I would make is that. The Bible is sort of this living, organic community interpretation. You know, we 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 it mm-hmm. shapes and forms us as a community of Christians. I mean, and so it's not. I mean, that's really not its function on some level is a state object. I mean, it just seems kind of ridiculous. Yeah, it kind of icon. takes the danger. It's yeah. It kind of takes the danger out of the Bible, right? The Bible it should be this kind of you know uh, volatile book that that you know, shapes and forms us and makes us think about different things in certain ways. And I think to make it a state state object seems to just kind of take the danger out of it. Well, speaking of danger, uh, (laughs) the article ends with this paragraph. The move to make the Bible the state's official book comes a month after Tennessee lawmakers approved a measure to make the Barrett M82 sniper rifle the official (laughs) state rifle. Uh, no Ooh, kidding. That's a goodie. Wow. No that's kidding. the last paragraph oh, of the article. And that's from so Tennessee. So they have a state rifle. Well, I, and the reason is the Barrett it's is made, made in Tennessee. Yeah. It's a Tennessee so, deal. So, so well, that maybe answers your other question. It's going to be the version of the Bible that's made in Tennessee. Tennessee, that's right. That'll, that'll be the one. It'll have to be published there. So. <laughs> Uh, well, it's um, you know uh, I'm sure there are people that feel like they're honoring God, trying to honor God and their their love for the Bible, and we all love the Bible, and and uh, um, but it's it just seems to have kind of missed the miss the point a little bit in the in the process. So. I, I think, but it, I got a feeling it's going to pass. Although I think it has a political ramification, sort of a thumb their nose at uh, mm-hmm. at, at, uh, at the attack on on christians too see so, so who knows uh where this is going to end up but i bet it ends up in court in one fashion or another and probably no other state object has ended up in court before uh, i'm glad so. this segment ended up that's that's good <laughs> it's, it's lunchtime guys all right it's time to finish up here on faith matters on the talk station Thank you for joining us for Faith Matters. Email your comments, questions, and suggestions to faithmatters at the talkstation.com. of the talk station.